Thank you, Senator Rounds. Now let me recognize Senator King. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Secretary, uh, I want to uh, discuss just for a moment one of those hard choices. The top uh, Navy unfunded priority is a destroyer that was eliminated from the budget and that it was already committed to under the multi-year procurement. Uh, the, th that has several problems. One, national security. These Flight 3 dest DDG destroyers are the workhorse of the Navy. Uh, eyes and ears around the world, very important uh, a part of our assets. But it also sent a shutter through the industrial base. Uh, it's unprecedented in my experience that a multi-year has been breached, which would actually cost the government money in, in penalties. I hope, Mr. Uh, Mr. Secretary, that you and Admiral Gilday can work with us uh, to restore that, that ship, because I think it has importance beyond just the you know, one ship, but the, the symbolism of breaking a multi-year and also pulling back on our commitment to in, in increasing the capacity of the Navy uh, is, I, th I think, uh, a, a very important priority. So uh, that's not really a question. It's, it's, a, it's a, uh, 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 an entreaty to you to work with us uh, to try to find the funds to uh, uh, restore that ship uh, and restore the, the, the Navy's number one unfunded priority. Will you uh, commit, me, commit to working with us on that? Absolutely, uh, Senator. We will do everything we can to uh, make sure that uh, we, have, we maintain a good working relationship with, uh, with Congress. Uh, and I appre appreciate your, uh, your tremendous support uh, throughout, and especially now. Uh, we want to make sure that we maintain an, uh, a ready, capable, and sustainable force. We also want to make sure that, uh, you know, the, the industrial base uh, has the ability to, uh, to, to produce uh, what we've asked them to produce. Um, and current plans are to, 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 to buy that DDG uh, in 23. So. Thank you. Uh, the, the importance of the industrial base is I, I live within eight miles of the industrial base in Maine, and, and the industrial base is not something you can just turn off and on. Uh, it's got to be something that's sustained and, and maintained over time. Uh, let me turn to a different topic. I believe one of the most serious risks this country faces today is accidental conflict with China. Uh, uh, some kind of conflict in the South China Sea, the Strait of Taiwan, and uh, uh, the danger of escalation from that accidental uh, conflict of some kind. It's concerning to me that we don't seem to have an effective hotline, direct line, whatever you want to call it, with China officials at your level and also at the presidential level. Uh, I understand the Chinese are reluctant about this, but I believe this is a, is a national, should be a national security priority. And, uh, I looked up yesterday, and I find that Amazon has 11 copies of the Guns of August in Chinese, and I think what I might do is buy those and send them to the Politburo in Beijing, uh, because of the, 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 this. This is a very clear and distinct danger. Do you agree with me that a better deconfliction link between mill to mill and also government to government with China would be uh, an important uh, mitigation of this risk? I absolutely agree with you. You know, as we look at uh, some of the aggressive behavior that we've witnessed uh, from China in the Indo-Pacific, uh, you know, I'm concerned about uh, about something that could uh, could happen that uh, could could spark a crisis. And I think uh, you know we need the ability to be able to talk with uh, both our allies and partners, but also our adversaries or potential adversaries. And so I think there needs to be. Uh, a direct line of communication mil between the military and also uh, between uh, government officials as well. So Thank I share your concern and I absolutely agree with you that this is critical. Thank you. Uh, one other area that's come to my attention, in fact, we had a hearing yesterday on missile defense and, and General Van Herc said uh, he had to pry the data out of another agency. We have Goldwater Nichols, which has enabled joint operations. We don't necessarily have the, a, a joint capability acquisition, particularly in the area of software. And I hope that we might work with you and General Milley and others on how to uh, uh, rationalize, if you will, uh, the joint a a 
uh, acquisition of things like software so that we don't have uh, silos uh, within the military that are analogous to the silos that we had pre Goldwater Nichols. Uh, is that something that you uh, will be willing to work with us on? Absolutely. I think it's, uh, it's critical and that you have my commitment to do so. General Milley, I'm sorry I didn't get my questions to you, but uh, may, perhaps we'll have a second round. Thank you very I'm much. I'm okay Mr. with Chairman. that, Senator. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Senator King. Uh, Senator Orange, please. Thank you, Chairman. And gentlemen, thank you very much for being here today and for your continuing service to our great United States of America. Um, superior weapons personnel and technology ensured that we won the 20th century. Um, but of course, now our adversaries have adapted their technologies. They've improved their operating concepts, and they've expanded their challenges into the new domains of cyber and space. And in fact, President Biden has stated, uh, the world is at an inflection point with shifting global dynamics and emerging crises that demand attention. Uh, we, of course, know that we face emboldened adversaries such as Vladimir Putin in Russia and President Xi Jinping in China. Um, both are actively seeking to, uh, to disrupt a stable and prosperous global order. And then, of course, we have other actors like Iran and North Korea presenting their own uh, significant threats. And as we are withdrawing from Afghanistan, we don't see the removal of a terrorist threat. Instead, we see, as the president has stated, the threat has become more dispersed, metastasizing around the globe. Um, so, of course, we want to make sure that we are, are funding and resourcing our uh, troops appropriately. Um, but going along with taking care of our own troops is working with others, allied nations. And Secretary Austin, in a March editorial in the Washington Post, you wrote about the importance of joint partnerships with other nations and called them force multipliers. I do agree with you, Secretary. You wrote it would be a huge strategic error to neglect these relationships, and it's a wise use of our time and resources to adapt and renew them, to ensure they're as strong and effective as they can be. Yet the president's defense budget guts our partner nation joint exercise budget compared to the pre-COVID levels by over 50%. Um, so how do you square your advocacy for improving our interoperability with our NATO allies and theater partners around the world with those proposed cuts? Well, well certainly with respect to NATO, we're, we're encouraging uh, the members of NATO to, uh, to, to do more, to invest in air defense, and also to do more to, uh, to contribute to, to NATO overall. Uh, what we've been been focused on is making sure that you know you've heard me say that China is our pacing challenge, and so we really uh, weighted our main effort there to to the Indo-Pacific region, and uh, you note that uh, my first trip out, uh, my first trip overseas was out to the region uh, along with Secretary Blinken, uh, and we visited uh, South Korea, we visited uh, Japan, and also made a, a visit to to India as well. Uh, again, uh, we truly value the importance of, uh, of strong relationships with our allies and partners. I think there's great capacity that can be, uh, can be leveraged there. And, uh, and so uh, in some areas, those partnerships, uh, while still strong, are not as strong as they could possibly be. So we'll remain focused on that. But, uh, uh, go ahead. I do hope so, Secretary. I think this is a, real, a really important area to focus on, making sure that we are able to leverage them and continue to use our allies as those force multipliers. And Mr. Secretary, I also wanted just to make a brief statement too. I do appreciate that you've stated uh, your commitment to making changes to how the military handles and prevents sexual assault. And I'm concerned concerned about the continued delay that we continued to face, though. Um, certainly, if any of our adversaries were attacking members of our military, as we have seen within our own ranks, members attacking other members within our own ranks, 
If it had been an adversary, we would have responded immediately. We must respond immediately as well. So I am encouraging um, both you and, and the chairman to continue to push on this issue to make sure we bring um, resolution and uh, justice for our members of the military, uh, those very important survivors. Um, just a brief statement, I'm sorry, General Milley, I didn't get to my questions for you either, and, uh, and Secretary McCord, I'll follow up with you later um, on the audit. Um, but I do wanna echo concerns that were raised by uh, Senator Fisher about um, the Navy's intent, whether it was an inter-office memo, whatever it was, I do also want to stress my concern that the Navy intends to cancel development of the Sea Launch nuclear cruise missile. Um, I think this is very, very concerning, um, especially coming from an, an acting secretary that has yet to be confirmed, and I hope that that is truly not reflective of the overall attitude of the Department of Defense. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It, it is not, Senator, and we will as we said, we will be true to our uh, our posture review and and uh, make sure that uh, that drives the process. Thank you, thank you, Senator Ernst. Uh, now let me recognize via WebEx Senator Warren. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you all for being here today, Secretary Austin. During your confirmation process, you disclosed that you were on the board of Raytheon Technologies, one of the nation's largest defense contractors. And that caused me to ask you for some commitments about ethics issues that you would face. Uh, existing ethics laws already require some commitments, but they don't go nearly far enough. And this matters a lot because the Pentagon spends $360 billion every year on goods and services provided by contractors. And those contractors have a revolving door with the DOD. So that's why I've introduced legislation to strengthen ethics rules for all public officials. But it's also why I asked you during your hearing to extend your recusal from matters involving Raytheon for the duration of your government service. I asked you to pledge not to receive or not to seek a waiver of that recusal and to refrain from seeking compensation from a giant defense contractor within four years of leaving government service. And you agreed to make those commitments, and I want you to know, I appreciate that. I think the American people appreciate that too. Secretary Austin, as I recall, you explained that you voluntarily made these commitments because you think it's important that the American people have concrete assurances so that they never doubt that you are working for them and not for giant defense contractors, right? Yes, that's true. Yeah. Good. And I just want to say, I also asked several Trump nominees to make the same commitments, and they refused. You, by contrast, demonstrated considerable leadership in making those commitments. Now, since your confirmation, the Senate has confirmed five additional nominees to go to work at the Pentagon. Not a single one of them was on the board of a major defense contractor. None of them reported that the bulk of their income came from our most powerful contractors. And I appreciated that and I supported all of their nominations. But this committee is now being asked to consider nominees who don't meet that test. And in these cases, when nominees report the vast majority of their income from major defense contractors, either through direct employment or consulting, or when they're on those companies' boards, I plan to ask nominees to make the same voluntary ethics commitments that you did during your confirmation. So let me ask you, Secretary Austin, do you agree that the people working for you who have similar or even more extensive ties to industry should be living up to the same ethics commitments that you made? Do you think it's important that the American people have confidence, as you put it, that these Pentagon officials are working for the American people and not for their former employers in the defense industry. Well, Senator, you've heard me say on a number of occasions that uh, sound ethical behavior is important to us, important to me, and important to the department. Uh, I have every reason to believe that uh, those who are 
who have been nominated to serve will conduct themselves uh, properly and, uh, and exercise uh, sound ethical behavior. And I truly support your, or, or I'm truly appreciative of your, uh, your support uh, in, uh, in getting our nominees confirmed uh, as quickly as possible. We, we absolutely need them on the team. Well, well I, I, let, let me say, though, I, I recognize the importance of filling these important Defense Department positions, but I'm asking for commitments that they are going to avoid conflicts of interest, and I've laid out what they are, and you've agreed to them. So the question I'm asking is whether you think that the people who are going to be working for you who have these ties should make the same kind of commitments that you may. Senator, I, I, again, I believe that they will conduct themselves appropriately. I, I have no concerns about their, their ethical behavior. I think that they are committed to doing the right things. Well, well I, look, look, I appreciate, I appreciate that, you that you don't want to step into this, but this is what leadership is about. Um, I'm still in conversation with the current nominees where I think these commitments are warranted, and I hope that we can come to an understanding as their nominations progress. And if we can, I will support their nominations. But in these cases and going forward, if nominees with significant ties to the defense industry refuse to make the commitments you made, then I will vote no in this committee on their nominations, and I will ask for a roll call vote on the floor where I will vote no again. So. Let me be clear, I'm asking for these commitments, not because I'm challenging anyone's integrity, but because I think it is critical that the American people have total confidence that our public officials are truly working for them and not for the defense industry that has paid them so well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Warren. Uh, let me recognize Senator Tillis, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentlemen, for being here. I want to go back to the discussion of the uh, UCMJ and, you know, what's described as the uh, military sexual assault. It's an area I'm frustrated with. I've spent a lot of time with Senator Gillibrand, but I am, uh, Secretary Austin, I am concerned that uh, even when we have the discussion here, people think we're just talking about military sexual assault, but we're talking about any um, alleged crime that would have a sentence of over one year. Uh, so that's a sweeping change to the uh, UCMJ. I'm also concerned with some of the technical aspects that haven't been spelled out uh, in, in the bill. Uh, the, it's, it's more of a, a framework. We haven't seen the details, but one of the things that I'm most troubled by is the six-month implementation time frame. And your judgment, uh, to the extent that you know the, the details of Senator Gillibrand's proposal, is that even possible to be implemented? Uh, I, I don't know all of the specific details of her proposed timeline. What I would tell you is, uh, and I would echo what I said to uh, the chairman a couple of minutes ago, is that I would, uh, any change that we make, Senator, I would hope that we would uh, be provided the ample time to make sure that we, we properly and appropriately uh, implement these changes because a change to the UCMJ is a, is a very uh, significant issue uh, in, in the military. And we want to make sure we get this right, and we will get it right if, if a change uh, is required. General Milley, do you think uh, maybe taking crimes that could be barracks larceny out of the chain of command is a good idea and would uh, uh, would put us in a position where good or <clears throat> good order and discipline on the part of the command would be undermined? Um, as I mentioned to uh, Senator Gillibrand before and some others earlier, uh, I think the commander is essential to maintaining good order and discipline in the military. We're a military that's built uh, to fight. The UCMJ is there to support combat power. Uh, at the same time, cohesion is critical, uh, and I am very, very open to significant change in the area of sexual assault, sexual harassment. When we get beyond that, at this point, my position is uh, I need to study it more. I'm open-minded, but I think we would be uh, really, it needs a lot of due diligence before we uh, bundle all the one-year felonies and take them away from the commander. So I think well, uh, I'd uh, ask the right to study it further. 
General Austin, I think you've uh, heard from some of us about the, uh, the need for a timely uh, report back on the commission findings and the DOD recommendations with the markup coming up next month. I think it's very important that we get that feedback uh, if it's to be, uh, if it's to have any impact on what may likely be in the NDA mark. Uh, as you're right, Senator. I, uh, and I understand your sense of urgency. I share that sense of urgency. As you know, um, the uh, Independent Review Commission is uh, still evaluating uh, the other three lines of, uh, of effort that include uh, prevention, victim care, and, uh, and also climate. I'll get those back uh, in, in a, you know, shortly. Uh, and when I do, I'll make my recommendations uh, uh, to the president, and those recommendations will be based upon what I get from the IRC, uh, plus my consultations with the leadership of the services. Uh, thank you. Uh, jumping to uh, budget matters, <clears throat> the uh, immediate response force, um, I know you know, you've spent some quality time, you and General Milley down at Fort Bragg. Um, it was deployed back in 2019 after the Iranian-backed Hezbollah attacked our embassy in Iraq. Um, the reports that I've got on the ground there is the, uh, the folks from the 82nd Airborne that would be a part of the response spent pretty much the day going over what you all know is a big complex, getting ready to do it at the expense of briefings and, and uh, preparation. The, uh, I want to make <laughs> the strategic deployment complex uh, is not yet even on the unfunded priorities list. Why is that? I, I, uh, I'll look into that, Senator. I don't know why the, uh, the Army hasn't put that on their unfunded re requirements list, uh, but I'm sure that uh, uh, it, the Army's uh, choice is based upon the input they've gotten from uh, from the 18th Airborne Corps commander and others, but well, uh, but I'll I'll engage the Army on it. We'll submit a, a question for the record because I am uh, I'm concerned that in a, an increasingly in an instance where we may have to uh, once again send out an immediate response deployment request that uh, they're not the best prepared that they could be for it. I'd like to get that reported back, and I'll submit other questions for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Tillis. Senator Hirono, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have had a number of opportunities, uh, Secretary Austin, to uh, raise my concerns about the fact that, that uh, HDRH Hawaii, the missile defense radar for Hawaii, has been zeroed out over the last two fiscal year uh, requests. And so uh, in response to some of my concerns raised about the fact that there is no funding requested for this radar, which was told to us that it was going to be very important uh, as part of our system to protect Hawaii. And I'm told that uh, under the current situation, currently protected against today's threats, um, that is the response I've gotten, Secretary Austin, but what we're looking at is we need to protect against future threats, i.e. 2025 threats. So I'm going to want to have further discussions with you and uh, your team as to what the projected dangers are going to 2025. I recognize that Hawaii is protected under today's threat, but not necessarily 2025. And that was the time frame in which the, this radio was determined to be necessary for our national security. So I don't want to get into a further uh, discussion with you at, uh, on the, the explanation as to why it was zeroed out. Let me move on to uh, support for the Pacific Deterrence Initiative. The PDI was enacted last year to ensure that DOD prioritizes, invests, and in often overlooked, but critical components of joint readiness. And in fact, we, with regard to the PDI, the previous commander of Indopaycom, Admiral Davison, identified five areas of focus in the PDI, one, the joint force lethality, two, force design and posture, three, strengthen allies and partners, four, exercises, experimentation and implementation, and five, logistics and security enablers. 
So looking at your budget request, though, I do not see um, requested items in the five areas that Admiral Davidson had identified as being supportive of the PDI. And in fact, uh, your request identifies platforms like a Navy destroyer, fleet oiler, and items related to the F-35 aircraft um, as PDI investments. So I'd like to know why is the vast majority of funding identified to support PDI unrelated to the lines of effort outlined in the Indo-PACOM Section 1251 report? Senator, let me say off the top that uh, our intent was to align our PDI investment with congressional intent. And uh, so my staff is currently working with the committee to, uh, to clarify and adjust any, any perceived misalignments and, and in fact make sure that, uh, that uh, we answer any and all questions. And so we'll, we'll continue to work that. As you know, we've dedicated some $5.1 billion to PDI. Uh, and, uh, and again, our intent was to align uh, our investments with, uh, with congressional intent. I would go further to say that a great deal of uh, the department's budget uh, is invested uh, in, in uh, capabilities and activities that, that concentrate on deterring China uh, and uh, and I would further say that I, you know I'm committed to working with the uh, with the committee to making sure that we we get that get it right and answer the needs of the commander out in uh, out in PACOM. Mr. Secretary, I, I appreciate that commitment toward aligning the congressional intent with what the uh, uh, combatant commanders are requesting, and I think that alignment needs to be uh, much better. And for, for example, the DOD is only partially funding Indo-PACOM's top three priorities that are important to deterring China, since you mentioned that just now. Uh, moving on to the importance of military construction and funding, of course, is, is uh, very critical to uh, what we need to be doing. And, and I've had conversations with your team regarding the need for a shipyard modernization and infrastructure support for that, including a new dry dock for Hawaii. Now, I know that there is request for uh, dry docks in Portsmouth, and uh, there is money also for a saltwater purification system in Norfolk. This is in front of a requested funding to move uh, the uh, dry dock for Hawaii along. And so I would request that you take a look at that and and it is very clear that the dry dock in Hawaii is very necessary for uh, the Hawaii Pearl Harbor shipyard to be able to uh, take care of the Virginia class submarines that are there. We have no capacity uh, to do that right now and so that dry dock needs to be moved along. So I request that you uh, look at the funding request and, and to see whether you can move the uh, appropriation request for the dry dock in Hawaii along. My time is up, but I hope that uh, you will continue to discuss with that, uh, discuss that particular concern with us. I, I understand, Senator. And and we're committed to making sure that we uh, maintain the ability to, uh, to maintain and sustain our, our, our force. And so uh, we'll take a look at that. So. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Hirano. Let me now recognize Senator Kramer and also alert all of my colleagues. There will be two votes beginning at 1130. And also, I believe the panel uh, sought a break uh, around that time. So, so talking with the ranking member, we'll uh, uh, figure out a strategy to accomplish all those objectives. Senator Kramer, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks to all of you for your service and for being here. Um, good to see you. I'm going to start, Secretary Austin, um, by following up with an, from an answer that you gave to Senator Shaheen earlier about further support uh, for the Afghan forces. And you specifically mentioned ISR support from the GCC. And I'm wondering if you could tell me specifically what kind of ISR support um, that is. What system? Well, certainly we're flying our MQ MQ-9s from there, and, and, and it's essentially uh, the vast majority of, uh, of ISR is, uh, is being provided from other places outside of Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. 
we, we've had to, you know, as we've retrograded, we've had to make sure we protect our, our key, key uh, platforms and systems there. Are Global Hawk Block 30s part of that? That's correct, yes. You know, you realize the Block 30s are slated for uh, retirement in this budget. And you and I have had this discussion before. I'm concerned about the lack of a bridge between where we are today and where we're going to get to eventually with new systems. And you have tough choices, and we've heard all about the, you know, the difficult priorities you have to set. But I remain concerned about the retirement of Block 30s prematurely um, to benefit our combatant commanders everywhere. But I think Afghanistan presents a rather unique example of, of the threat. Um, with that, General Milley, could I ask you, um, are the combatant commanders getting all of the ISR support that they need in every theater? I would tell you that uh, as Chief Staff of the Army for four years and Chairman for almost two, no combatant commander has ever gotten all the ISR they want. <laughs> uh, it is one of those commodities that is in high demand um, all the time, and no one is completely ever satisfied. Every commander wants perfect knowledge, and that's what ISR does, is feed you with knowledge. But we are never going to get uh, enough ISR to fill all the demand. Having said that, uh, it's all a function of risk. It's all a function of where you take risk, what your priority is, uh, are you going to support the main effort, and what do you do for the supporting effort, and so on and so forth. Uh, and, in, and in this budget, I think that we are adequately uh, funding uh, ISR as we go forward for the main effort relative to China. And with respect to the Block 30s uh, and the MQ-9s, uh, again, it has to do with relevance and pivoting to the future. This budget biases future operating environment, change in the character of war, and against the pacing threat of China. That is not to say we're going to stop everything with respect to A-10s or MQ-9s or some of these systems. <clears throat> We've got to make that turn. So s since you were on the topic, what, if you could list the top three threats to America's national security in order, what would they be? From a military standpoint, a strictly military standpoint, I think China is the number one military threat as we go forward. But I also acknowledge that Russia is a considerable great power competitor. And, and, and those two, in the NDS and in the current strategic environment from a military perspective, there are many, many threats. But from a military perspective, I put those two up there. I understand. One of the things I want to get at is because just, I think it was just yesterday, <clears throat> President Biden announced when he announced America's back in sure. Europe uh, to, to military men and women, uh, Air Force in the uh, in UK, that the number, according to the military leaders, that the number one threat facing America's national security is climate change. Six weeks ago today, the European Union Parliament, speaking of NATO and allies, which are a prominent part of your testimony in this budget, um, EU Parliament passed a resolution 569 to 67 urging the EU institutions and member states to, uh, to do everything they can to stop the completion of the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. Three weeks ago today, President Biden lifted the sanctions on completing the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. And, uh, and I'm just kind of wondering, and that, that flies in the face both of, of America's back, it flies in the face of uh, building NATO alliances, rebuilding as, as, as the budget document states, I'm not sure which ones we lost, but I know that there are at least eight European Union allies, including Ukraine, who strongly oppose Nord Stream 2 for national security reasons. And certainly, from climate change standpoint, if climate change is the number one threat facing America's national security, allowing Nord Stream 2 to be built is not good for the climate. So um, I have some great concerns, and, and uh, I think we, we, ought to get them, we ought to get them straightened out. And I don't know for the life of me how, how Completing Nord Stream 2 helps our alliance with the European Union, other than maybe with the current Chancellor of Germany. And Senator, if I could just make please, a comment on, on, please the, do. on, on your, your piece about the threats. Um, climate change is a threat. Uh, climate change has significant impact on military operations, uh, and we have to take it into consideration. Climate change is going to impact natural resources, for example. It's going to impact increased instability in various parts of the world. It's going to impact migrations and, and so on. Uh, and in addition to that, we have infrastructure challenges here at home, witness some of our hurricanes and stuff. So climate change does impact. Um, but the president is looking at it at a much broader angle than I am. I'm looking at it from a strictly military standpoint. And from a strictly military standpoint, I'm putting China and Russia up there. That is not, however, in conflict with the acknowledgement that climate change or infrastructure or education systems, national security has a broad angle to it. 
Uh, I'm looking at it from a strictly military standpoint. I just think it's peculiar that the president would go to a, another continent and tell our service members there that the number one um, threat is climate change, albeit a threat. Um, with that, my time's expired. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator Kramer. Uh, in uh, collaboration with the ranking member uh, and uh, at the request of the panel to take a short break at this time, I would uh, move to recess for 10 minutes. Uh, it also would allow people to go to the vote, which has just been called. Uh, and so with that, I would ask for a 10 minute recess. Let me call the hearing uh, back to order after the short recess and recognize Senator Blumenthal for his questions. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary, uh, Chairman Milley, for your extraordinary service, and thank you for being here today. Um, I have been uh, very concerned about the ship that apparently has been sent from Iran to Venezuela. Uh, apparently two Iranian vessels are believed to be carrying arms intended to transfer uh, to Venezuela. As you know, these ships, ships are thought to be carrying weapons that would fulfill a deal that Iran and Venezuela made a year ago. We don't know the types of weapons. Uh, at least as far as I know, there are reports that Venezuela was considering purchasing missiles from Iran, including long-range ones. Uh, commercial satellite imagery of one of the ships shows fast attack boats loaded on the deck. But it's still unclear whether those boats were aboard when the ships began their journey. Uh, I was pleased to see that a senior administration official stated that delivery of these weapons would be a, quote, provocative act and understood as a threat to our partners in the Western Hemisphere, end quote, and that the United States would reserve the right to take appropriate measures, quote, in coordination with our partners to deter the transit or delivery of such weapons. Secretary Austin, uh, Allowing this ship to dock seems significant to me on many different levels. Uh, it would be the first time that Iranian vessels have made such a transit, and the precedent of allowing Iran to provide weapons to the region causes me grave concern. Do you share that concern? And how would such a delivery affect the region, in your view? Well, Senator, thanks for the question. And I, uh, I am absolutely concerned uh, about the proliferation of, uh, of uh, weapons, uh, any type of weapons uh, in, uh, in, in our neighborhood. And so uh, I, I share your concern. Can, can you tell me uh, whether the administration knows exactly what is on those Iranian vessels? I would would like to take uh, that conversation, uh, either either that question to uh, uh, for the record, or I we could take that conversation in another for, uh, in another forum. I'd be glad to do it in another forum in a, another setting. Uh, are you uh, have you had any communication with your colleagues in other nations in this hemisphere? I've not had any discussions with uh, with uh, any other nations uh, in our hemisphere on this issue. Let me ask you, on the topic of uh, white supremacy and violent extremism, which you and I have discussed both in your confirmation hearings and privately, uh, I understand that there will be a task force report. Can you tell us? when that report will be released? Did, 
I'm sorry, Senator, I, I didn't quite hear the, the question. Uh, can you provide an update as to the status of the extremism task force that you announced re recently and when uh, this committee can expect to be briefed on the results? As you'll recall, Senator, uh, early on in, uh, in my tenure, I uh, uh, asked the force to uh, conduct a, a brief uh, stand down to discuss the issue of, of extremis extremism in our ranks. And, and, uh, and let me preface what I'm going to say by saying that, you know, I'm convinced, totally convinced, that 99% of our troops are focused on the right things and, and doing the right things and embrace the right values each and every day. But uh, as I may have mentioned to you earlier, I believe that small numbers can have an outside of effect, uh, outsized effect uh, you know, regarding this issue. Uh, so we did gain some insights uh, from, uh, from the stand down and it was, it was a great opportunity for leaders to have discussions with other leaders and leaders to have discussions with subordinates uh, and talk about uh, those behaviors, and we are focused on behaviors, those behaviors that, uh, that are not supportive of the values that, uh, that we embrace. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we stood up a counter-extremism working group, which, uh, you know, routinely monitors, uh, you know, our efforts across the department in terms of, you know, what we're doing to, uh, to make sure that uh, we counter extremism or extremist behaviors. Uh, they will, uh, they're refining our policies uh, and, uh, and also uh, gaining a better understanding of, uh, of you know, what, of the, of the complete challenge. Uh, and certainly, you know, I can have the leadership of that, uh, that working group come to, uh, come to brief you uh, upon request or anytime you, you want, so. I would, I would very much appreciate that, Mr. Secretary, and I applaud the efforts that you are making against that probably less than 1%, as you said, 99%, but I think it's an even more overwhelming majority who adhere to the basic values and are dedicated patriots. And the focus on that less than 1% is well warranted because they may have an outsized effect. And so I would welcome an opportunity to learn more from your, from the task force whenever yeah it is appropriate to do so, and I'll be in touch with your office if that's okay. And I would absolutely agree with you, Senator, that it is, it is less than 1%, uh, and uh, we'll gain uh, better insights and, and also equip our, our, uh, our force with better policies and, and definitions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator Bloomsville. Uh, Senator Blackburn, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate that you all are here today. Secretary Austin, I want to come to you on the issue of nuclear deterrence. And when you went through your confirmation hearing, we had a discussion about this. And in your advanced policy questions, you had made a statement, and I'm quoting you, the tipping point where we must simultaneously overhaul these forces is now here. And that was your comment in reference to nuclear deterrence. And while we're looking at this budget that's before us, we see that modernization is fully funded. But then when you look at deferred maintenance, um, you see that it cuts hundreds of millions of dollars from the enacted level of the NNSA's Deferred Maintenance Budget. So we know that more than half of the NNSA facilities are over 40 years old, 30% date back to the 40s. So to me, this sounds like we're at a tipping point when we discuss these facilities. So um, was that deferred maintenance cut coordinated with DOD, and realistically, what effect will it have on the ability of the NNSA to meet the DOD requirements? Uh, it, uh, to my knowledge, it was not coordinated with, uh, with DOD. Uh, and what I would say to you, though, Senator, is it's, it's very important to me 
and to our department to make sure that we work with the Department of Energy to ensure that, uh, that we achieve uh, our common goal of maintaining uh, you know, a, a robust uh, nuclear deterrent. And uh, you have my commitment to make sure that I remain engaged with DOE, DOE to make sure that the right things are happening in, in this regard. Okay, then let me ask it like this. What are the consequences that happen if we do not modernize and uh, bring this infrastructure, maintain this infrastructure? Yeah. Well, you, you've heard me uh, say before, Senator, that um, the, you know I'm absolutely committed to the modernization of the triad, and you know that uh, we've dedicated $28 billion in this 22 budget to, uh, to that effort. Uh, maintenance is also uh, important, and, and again, uh, with respect to NNSA, uh, we will remain engaged with, uh, with DOE to make sure that the right things are happening and gain a better understanding of what DOE's objectives are. Well, you all frequently will say that infrastructure is a part of what you need to retain talent. Mm -hmm. and. I would expect that the enterprise's invaluable workforce, as they are, as we look at 21st century warfare, um, that it is difficult for them to continue to work in dilapidated and sometimes unsafe conditions. And I would assume that that is a concern to you also. It absolutely is a concern, both for what uh, the the issues that DOD uh, controls, and also, you know, uh, I'm sure it's a concern for all the things that DOE is responsible for as mm -hmm. well. Um, let's go. And Senator Fisher brought up uh, to you um, the action of the acting Secretary of the Navy canceling the nuclear sea launch cruise missile. So why was this decision made before completion of the nuclear posture review? Uh, again, uh, Senator, I, I've not seen the memo, and, but, but I, like the chairman, I will see it very shortly after this hearing. Uh, and, uh, you know, as I understand the purpose of that memo was to, was to issue some guidance uh, for planning and evaluation to, uh, to the Navy. Uh, but again, uh, I am committed to conducting a nuclear posture review that I've, we talked about earlier, and that will be conducted, and that will drive our, our activities going forward. So. Well, I think that memo sent a message we did not want to send to Russia and China when it comes to great power competition. Um, I did appreciate the department uh, being on, on pace to fully fund the... PDI, and I, um, the concern is the number one PDI ask was the Guam defense system to be fully funded at the $350 million. But when you look through this, the funding totals for the defense of Guam procurement and the Guam defense development line items in the the budget was $118.3 million, and that's less than half of the money that is required and uh, for this, which is the number one unfunded priority, if you will. So I'd like to hear you speak to that. Um, you know, we know that these fusion centers are vitally important. I've done a good bit of work on these multilateral fusion centers, and they serve a critical function of really enhancing our intelligence, our information, our logistical coordination. And um, future fusion centers are the commander's number 11 unfunded priority. These fusion centers also support investments in mission partner environments, the number two unfunded priority. So it seems like we've got a, a, a pattern that is going here, and I'd love for you to address that. I know I'm over, and there are others waiting for questions, and I would be happy to take that response in writing. We, we will mo most certainly get it to you, Senator. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Blackburn. Let me recognize Senator Peters, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, each of our uh, 
uh, witnesses here today. Thank you for your, for your service, and thank you for being here today. But I want to start uh, first by, by saying how disappointed, uh, and I'll just say actually quite angry, at a recent decision uh, made by the Air Force to not award Selfridge Air National Guard Base the F-35 International Training Mission. Uh, and my feelings are, are based uh, on the data uh, and the criteria that was presented both by all, each of the installations that competed as well as what the Air Force uh, put forward. It's clear from my review of that and others that Selfridge was clearly the uh, superior choice uh, in the, the matter. Uh, and uh, this is clearly a problem that has, as we have seen before with the Air Force. As all of you know, the GAO is now investigating uh, strategic uh, basing decisions being made by the Air Force over the last uh, few years. And without question, this, this committee, this body, uh, needs to retain confidence that the choices made by the U.S. Air Force are based on data and based on criteria and not uh, at a whim or whatever may be behind it. So, so my question for you, uh, Secretary Austin, is do I have your commitment that you will review the Air Force's F-35 International Training Mission decision and we'll have an opportunity to talk about that? You do have my commitment that uh, that I will review it as I do uh, all just all of those types of decisions over time, and I would also offer to have the Air Force come in and, and brief you on their decision. The Air Force uh, typically uses a very detailed process to make those kinds of decisions, and I would offer that uh, politics has no uh, no place in this this decision making process, this type of decision making process, and so uh, you know it. If you desire for the Air Force to come and, and do a lay down for you, I'm sure that uh, they'll be willing to do that. So. Well, I appreciate that. I've had some of those discussions already, but to make sure that the process is indeed an objective process, it's critically important. There's full transparency so that we can see not only how Selfridge ranked based on those that data and the criteria, but also how the one that was selected also ranked. So there could be a true objective comparison of that criteria. We tend to just get one side and not hear the other side. I wanna make sure that all of our questions are, are asked as that's something I assume you would, would uh, certainly support. Thanks, Senator. My guidance and requirement is that we always uh, try to be as transparent as possible, so. I appreciate that. Now, while I understand the uh, FY22 budget uh, contains uh, or continues to fund uh, PFAS remediation, the, re the reality is that the funding requested is not anywhere close uh, to being sufficient to address the contamination that we continue to find uh, in Michigan, and unfortunately, hundreds of other sites all across uh, the country. Uh, and the price tag to address PFAS contamination uh, comes on top of what is already a staggering backlog of environmental remediation needs uh, facing the department. Uh, this is why I've joined my fellow uh, Armed Services Committee members uh, in introducing legislation to expedite cleanup of some of the most contaminated sites and why I'll continue to work to implement clear and enforceable standards uh, to guide those. So to Secretary Austin, uh, how does the department's budget address the management uh, challenge presented by these literally forever chemicals? And I know this isn't a problem that we're gonna be able to solve in a year or, or quite frankly, even in the next decade. But the longer we wait to address uh, these toxic contaminations, the higher the eventual cost is to our service members, to our communities, and quite frankly, to the U.S. taxpayers. Yeah, as you know, there's provisions in this budget uh, to, to address uh, remediation for, for contaminated sites. Uh, I, I would, and, and this is, you know, this will, extend obviously well beyond this budget and so you have my commitment to continue to work this uh, going forward. I just recently met with the EPA administrator a couple of weeks ago uh, to, to focus on this and a couple of other issues uh, and it, I, it was a very good meeting. We committed to working together and, and, uh, and making sure that, uh, that you know we we met the standards of remediation and we, and we had good procedures for remediation. Um, this is a significant challenge to our country, as you pointed out. You know, DOD is, a, is an element of a larger challenge. Uh, obviously, we're not the only source of, uh, of this contaminant. 
but I would tell you that DOD is committed to doing its part uh, to remediating uh, uh, whatever damage has been done uh, in every part of this country where we have, uh, where we have contributed to this. Well, thank you, uh, Secretary Austin. I appreciate uh, your attention to both of the matters that I raised uh, and look forward to working with you. Thank you, Senator Peters. Senator Sullivan, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, gentlemen, thank you for your service. Thank Ms. Secretary, General Milley, you know uh, how much respect I have for both of you. You have a hard job, especially coming here to defend a budget you probably don't like or didn't support internally, but you got to do it now. And that's a tough job. But let me just mention, budgets are a reflection of an administration's priorities. Take a look at this chart. I handed this chart out to you as well, this chart here. The Biden administration in its $6 trillion budget blowout clearly prioritizes defense and homeland security dead last. Dead last. If you look at, uh, in terms of inflation adjusted, uh, it's actually a cut. Now, I think a lot of us here, Democrats and Republicans, think national security should be prioritized first, not last. Uh, I think you gentlemen probably believe that. But importantly, how can we tell the troops that you're leading that we are prioritizing their mission, which is defending America, when it's clear that the Biden administration's prioritization of their mission is last, a declining defense budget when almost every other agency in the federal government is getting a massive double-digit increase. Ms. Secretary, you want to try to take that one on first? Uh, thanks, Senator. Uh, what I uh, will tell our troops and what I uh, have told them and will continue to tell them is that I truly believe that the uh, President's uh, budget gives us the flexibility to go after the right mix of capabilities to, mm -hmm. uh, to defend the nation and to deter, deter aggression. No, I, uh, I mean, I understand that. I've been watching the hearing. I get it. I'm just talking about the – and again, it's a tough question for you because you're not in charge of these other agencies like OMB and the White House is. But they're clearly not prioritizing the military and national defense relative to any other agency at all. I mean, look at this, look at this chart. They are putting the national security mission dead last in terms of the prioritization of budgets. How do we tell our troops that, hey, we're putting you first? Our troops are always first. They're, they're first now. They will always be first going forward. And, uh, and again, uh, I do th believe that we have what we need to, uh, uh, to uh, go after the right capabilities. So. Okay. Let me, uh, let me talk. There's been a lot of focus. Uh, Senator Kramer talked about this issue of climate change. Clearly, our country is, needs to address this issue. It's a big issue in Alaska. I'm always puzzled, though, how our military is task organized to do this. You know, I uh, had the honor of serving with you at CENTCOM. General Milley, we overlapped, overlapped briefly in Afghanistan. Uh, I don't think in any of my military service I heard climate change as a phrase mentioned once. I heard the Taliban, Iraq, Iran, IEDs. Nevertheless, Ms. Secretary, in your opening statement, you mentioned climate change 15 times in lethality twice, which I think is a bit of a mismatch. I was just in... South Korea and Taiwan. You guys also mentioned China as our pacing threat. Let me, let me ask a simple question that relates to these two priorities. What is a more immediate threat to our national security interests that DOD has the capability of responding to, particularly in the Asia Pacific, a Chinese communist invasion of Taiwan or the challenge of climate change? I think it's a pretty simple question. I think it's actually a really simple answer. Mr. Secretary, do you have a uh, well, first, I, I don't recall mentioning climate change 15 times. I'll go back and do my word count. I think it was in your written statement. Uh, okay. Um, and, and let me also be clear, uh, Senator, that uh, lethality, lethality is important. This is the most lethal force that are, that, that's ever taken, uh, has ever uh, occupied the planet, and it will remain so going forward. And that's what we remain focused on in the Department of Defense defending but, this nation, and we'll go after the capabilities required can I, to do that. So Taiwan invasion of China, of 
by the Chinese Communist Party or climate change. I think it's very simple. The, what, what, what's the most immediate threat DOD can respond to? The most significant military threat that uh, we're focused on, and you've heard me say this probably a hundred times, Senator, is, is, uh, is China. Uh, it's our pacing challenge, and uh, that's what we've asked you uh, a number of times to, to help us resource uh, our efforts on that challenge, and I appreciate what you've done thus far, uh, and I know that, uh, that you'll continue to help us going forward. Let me ask one final question. Sorry, Mr. Chairman, it's related to that. I have another chart here. It shows that uh, our budget increases or decreases relative to the Chinese. The Chinese have dramatically and consistently increased their defense budget annually by at least 6%, sometimes as much as 13%. Uh, we've increased ours during the Trump administration when the Republicans controlled the Senate. Uh, you see during the Biden administration, Obama-Biden, it was dramatically cut. Now we're looking at cuts again. What message does this chart send to China and our allies in the region, and can we sustain our declining comparative advantage over China militarily if these trends continue? And that, that's both for the Secretary and General Milley. Well, the message that, I, that, uh, that I'm concerned about is a message that, uh, that we send to the world, and that is that we're going to continue to go after the capabilities uh, and develop the operational concepts uh, to be able to defer anyone who would want, to deter, excuse me, anyone who would, who would venture to take on the United States of America. So we will have the capabilities necessary to defend this nation. General. So, so Senator, uh, a couple of things. I, I want to go back, uh, make two points uh, on the budget piece, explaining it to the soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, Guardians out there. Um, we're getting $715 billion if this is passed. That's a lot of money. That's 50% of the entire president's budget. Uh, that's one out of every $2 in the discretionary spending of the federal government. That is not a small amount of change. Uh, the increases that you show in your chart, those are factually correct, but relative to the whole and in context, we're getting a lot of money. Uh, so that's the first thing. Uh, second thing uh, is relative to climate change. Uh, paragraph one of every operations order I've ever seen for 41 consecutive years, says enemy situation to include weather and terrain. We always consider it weather, and climate change is weather at the strategic level. It has military impact. But we're not going to change climate change. The Department of Defense is not going to change climate change, but we must consider it in our, uh, in our strategic calculations all the time because it's going to increase instability overseas. It has impact in our infrastructure here. So climate change is real. Uh, the military threat is China, as the Secretary just said, is a pacing threat. We are calculating all of our uh, calculations relative to that as a pacing threat, and others are second uh, in, in nature. Uh, and the third piece uh, relative uh, to the China versus U.S. spending. Uh, this is a disturbing trend. There's no question about it with respect to China. They, are, they have made a major economic investment in developing their military. It's been going on for 20 or 30 years. The gaps that used to exist, say, 20, 30 years ago were like this. Today they're like that. And the Chinese have a deliberate plan to be a global challenger to the United States of America militarily by mid-century. Uh, we have got to continue strong investments in our military, and I think this budget uh, for this year is an adequate investment right now. We have to set the conditions, though, to pivot to the future character of war with the pacing threat of China. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Sullivan. Let me now recognize via WebEx Senator Duckworth. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman. Um, Good morning, gentlemen. Thank you so much for being here today. Uh, and thank you for your service to our country. While responding to the COVID-19 pandemic, natural disasters and civil unrest are seamless, seamlessly integrating with the joint force and overseas operations. The National Guard and Reserve component continues to answer the call. Over the past 20 years, the high demand for reserve component forces has necessitated a shift from a strategic reserve to an operational force. In fact, last June, over 120,000 National Guard troops were mobilized, more than at any time since World War II. In short, our nation relies on our reserve component forces, the reserves and the National Guard, to defend the United States and fulfill the DOD's national security responsibilities. However, even though the National Guard and reserves are serving in critical capacities and in dangerous duty assignments, they are not receiving the same pay and benefits as their active duty counterparts. 
The complexity of the current slate of duty statuses adds unnecessary confusion to activating reserve component forces. The disparity in pay and benefits between different duty statuses can also incentivize manipulation of or manipulating orders to minimize the service member's access to benefits. I believe duty status reform is necessary to ensure the National Guard and Reserve Forces receive equal pay and access to the health care and educational benefits they deserve for the work that they do. Bottom line, service members doing the same job in the same place should not earn different pay and benefits based on their duty statuses. General Milley, could you please update me on the DOD's plans to, to address reserve component duty status reform? And when do you anticipate releasing your findings? Thanks, Senator. Um, you know, as part of the Joint Force, uh, active duty, uh, reserve, uh, and National Guard, it's a total force. Uh, and, and, and we have a commitment uh, to ensure that we have appropriate and fair uh, pay and benefits uh, given to our National Guard soldiers and our, or, or our troops uh, and our reservists. Uh, that reform effort is underway. Uh, we're reviewing that. I can't give you the exact date of when we'll have that to you, uh, but we are working it, and we're working it very hard, and we're working it with uh, both the National Guard Bureau and each of the services. Uh, but we do recognize the need to ensure that it's uh, evenly applied in terms of uh, pay and benefits to the soldiers in the reserve component or the troops in the reserve component. Well, we will you also, will you also um, uh, commit to making sure that whatever the reform proposal is, that it is... Uh, appropriately shaped to eliminate orders manipulation and current pay and benefit disparities? Sure, absolutely. Sure. Now, our commitment is to ensure that everyone who wears the cloth of our nation, uh, whether they're active, guard, or reserve, uh, and no matter where they are, are treated equally uh, in all respects to include pay and benefits. And, and I'll, I commit to that to you, and I'll get you the answer on the exact date of uh, when the reform proposals are due in. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, uh, Secretary Austin, reserve component service members are required to maintain the same proficiency in certain critical skill sets as the active component counterparts, even though they don't necessarily put on the uniform every day. This is especially true for as pilots, for example. Yet they only receive the incentive pay at a fraction of the amount of active service members. I believe every service member, whether active or on reserves duty, deserves to be fairly compensated for maintaining mission essential skills. And the RAND Corporation has shown that incentive pay can help improve retention and is far more cost effective than training new service members to replace those who separate. As we continue to strengthen our National Guard and Reserve Forces, we must retain our talented service members. That's why I introduced the bipartisan National Guard and Reserve Incentive Pay Parity Act to help ensure that reserve component service members in high skill roles are compensated at the same rates as their active duty counterparts. Secretary Austin, will you commit to exploring options such as the Incentive Pay Parity Act to help improve retention, especially of those service members with critical skills? I will, Senator, and for all the reasons that uh, General Milley mentioned, uh, you know, our Guard and Reserve have done amazing work uh, the skill sets that you're talking about in many cases are, are war fighting or combat or related skills, and so it's absolutely important that they are proficient and, uh, and they should receive the same uh, proficiency pay. So. Thank, Thank you. you. And, um, I, I have a question I, I will submit for the record, um, but it has to do with modernization efforts to continue across the joint force and um, wanting to know whether DOD and the military services are factoring in program performance into decisions about how to prioritize budget requests to adequately resource successful programs, such as future vertical lift. But I will submit that for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Senator Duckworth. Let me recognize Senator Scott. Thank you, Chairman. First off, I think I want to thank each of you for your willingness to serve. You have um, very significant roles for um, for our country, probably the most important thing we can be doing is making sure we defend our freedoms. Would, would any of you disagree that we're dealing with, com when you th you're thinking about Communist China, you're thinking about a, a, uh, a party uh, that either wants world domination or, the, at the worst case, wants to absolutely control the Indo-Pacific? I, I do believe that their, their, their goal is to control the Indo-Pacific, and, uh, and I also believe that they they uh, desire to be uh, the, the dominant or preeminent uh, country in, in, in the world. 
And so I think uh, they're working uh, towards that end. So would you all disagree that their goal is to eventually uh, take back Taiwan, an, uh, a great American ally? Everybody, anybody wouldn't, wouldn't disagree with that, right? I would not disagree with the point that they are they have a goal of uh, eventually uh, uniting uh, uh, Taiwan with, uh, with, with China. Yeah. And that would be whether they do it through volu voluntarily or involuntarily uh, through, uh, through the military. Do you all believe that um, we're going to continue to see more surveillance uh, by the Communist Party of China of American citizens and our allies around the world? And we're seeing more surveillance all the time. You agree with that, right? Uh, it, there's, I mean, it stands to reason that uh, whatever le level of surveillance that's ongoing now will, will continue uh, and, and quite possibly increase uh, going forward. So if you, if you look at this, you saw what uh, Senator Sullivan brought up. You saw the fact that, you know, year after year, they're investing more in their military. Their goal is to have an economy bigger than ours. And you seem to agree that if they have an economy bigger than ours, they're going to increase their defense spending. And as uh, General Milley says, it's getting closer and closer. So, and if China is able to pull all this off, then our opportunities all over the world, opportunities of American citizens and our way of life is, is going to change, right? If they, if they can do, fill, fulfill their goals, then our opportunities will be diminished. Would you all agree with that? Yeah, you know, I, I would describe our our our, our relationship with China currently is one of competition. I think, again, you've mentioned that they desire to be the preeminent country in the, uh, on the planet, and, uh, and that is, in fact, the case. Their mid- to long-term goal is to do that. Uh, they look to compete with us, not only militarily, but uh, across a spectrum of activity. And, uh, and what, what you see us doing, uh, the military and 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 uh, in other sectors in our in our in our government is making sure that uh, we remain competitive, uh, with you know economically, uh, making sure that we're developing uh, the best uh, the best we continue to develop the best scientists in in the world and and we do the you know the, the most comprehensive research. So it is a competition across a broad spectrum of activity. So if you follow through the reasoning. If if China wants to be, you know, either Indo-Pacific or world dominant, if they build an economy bigger than ours, <clears throat> they continue to out-invest us in the military, which they are, or at least growing faster than we are, then what are y'all doing to, one, inform American citizens of the risk? Because, you know, we all do a budget based on what the American citizens believe the priority is. That's how we elect our elected, do our elected leaders. So what are y'all doing to, one, inform the public of the risk of communist China and ensuring that we have the budget we need to make sure that in five or 10 or 15 years, we're not sitting here, we're saying we wish we would have done more. We all saw this threat, but we didn't do enough about it. Yeah, just uh, about every time you hear me, uh, you hear me speak, uh, Senator, I know you, you probably grow tired of me talking about the competition with China, but that is my, that is my focus. Uh, my number one focus is to defend this nation and protect our interests. Our pacing challenge is and will continue to be China. And again, we're going after the capabilities uh, that can, uh, that can you know, match the, uh, the operational concepts that we're putting into play uh, and allow us to be not only competitive but actually dominant uh, in, uh, in this competition. So that's what the Department of Defense is doing, and I think you see activity across uh, the entire government that's focused on making sure that we uh, not only can compete with China, but maintain our edge uh, with respect to China. Do you think it's important that, that in your role that you uh, inform the American public of the risk of communist China so everybody will be more focused on making sure we have the military budget we need? Uh, we, we, we do so routinely, and we will continue to do that, uh, Senator Scott. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Scott. Let me recognize Senator Rosen, please. There it is. Uh, thank you, Chairman Reed. 
uh, Ranking Member Inhofe for holding this hearing. I'd like to thank the witnesses for your service to our great nation. Thank you for being here today. Um, you know, right before the break, Senator Kramer was talking to you about uh, our ISR requirements and his concerns, and I am concerned um, as well about the MQ-9. So, Secretary Austin, the MQ-9 Reaper, I don't have to tell you, it's critical to supporting our current intelligence, surveillance, and recogniz uh, recognizance requirements. A key part of the MQ-9 architecture is the mission at Nevada's Creech Air Force Base. Last year, CENTCOM Commander General McKenzie included additional MQ-9 funding at the top of his unfunded priorities, and in April, he told this committee of the MQ-9's importance and his need for more of them not fewer. The Air Force today still lacks the ISR capacity to meet combatant commanders' requirements contained in the 2018 National Defense Strategy. Despite this, the Department has previously proposed cutting this platform, their most cost-effective, without a program of record to replace it, which would further risk widening the ISR capability gap that General uh, Milley talked about. So, Secretary Austin, what is the Department's plan for the MQ-9? And given its importance, cost-effectiveness, and the requirement for combatant commanders for more ISR assets, why is the Air Force uh, cut uh, funding for this program without a program of record to replace it? Well, th thank you, Senator. Uh, I think you heard General Milley talk earlier about uh, the way combatant commanders view uh, ISR, having been a combatant commander in a former life. I can tell you I, I, I agree with him. There is never enough ISR. I will always want more. Uh, the, the, the Air Force has, uh, has committed to taking off uh, a, a number of lines of ISR, but they're not reducing the tails, the, the, the aircraft, uh, that go with those lines. What they're doing is, is uh, making sure that they, they upgrade and modernize uh, their, their aircraft uh, where possible and so that they can, they can network the aircraft uh, uh, better. So the number of tails is not being reduced. The number of lines is being reduced slightly. And so there's going, can you get to us some information about that so we know what the program of record will be going forward and how it can impact us. A absolutely. Thank you. I appreciate that. I'd like to move on to talking about a little, a little bit about Iranian aggression, how we combat that, because Iranian-backed militias, of course, are increasingly targeting U.S. installations, our service members in Iraq, the rocket and drone attacks. Uh, Iran continues to be the world's leading state sponsor of terrorism threat to the U.S., allied interests all across the, uh, the world via its ballistic missile program, its support for terrorist proxies like Hezbollah, Hamas, KH, AAH, and many others. And so according to a recently re re uh, released annual threat assessment of the U.S. Intelligence Committee, Intelligence Committee, and I quote, Iran supported Iraqi Shia militias will continue to pose the primary threat to U.S. personnel in Iraq. So to Secretary Austin and General Milley, uh, with the constant threat to the U.S. and coalition forces in the Mideast posed by Iran and Iran-backed militia groups, what are we doing to counter them, and how are we proactively protecting our forces and personnel? Do we have what we need uh, to do that and prevent them, prevent these militias and terrorists from targeting our U.S. troops in the region? Yeah, we we certainly uh, continue to demand that Iran cease its uh, malicious be behavior in the region in terms of its support of uh, the Iranian-backed Shia, Shia militia groups. And we, we demand that uh, they, they cease providing them, uh, you know, uh, modernized equipment so that they can conduct these kinds of attacks. Uh, we're doing everything within our po within our power, within our capability, to make sure that our our troops that are forward deployed uh, have adequate protection. Uh, we're engaging the Ira the Iraqi leadership to make sure that the Iraqi leadership does what's necessary uh, to protect, help protect our citizens who are there to help the Iraqi uh, Iraqi government. So I would say, uh, in addition to everything the Secretary said is uh, think offense, defense. So in terms of defense, the force protection of the force, the, the disposition of exactly where they're at, how many they're at, 
uh, what's the hardening of those sites, we're doing all of those measures. In addition to that, we have uh, uh, missile, uh, not missile defense, but air defense capabilities, CRAMs, counter rocket and mortar, and counter UAS systems that were put in place. Those have been proven quite effective, actually, against some of the Shia militia group capabilities. We're going to continue to uh, reinforce all of that. On the offense side, uh, I won't discuss it here, uh, but I can discuss it in some detail in a classified session as to what we can do, uh, what we're prepared to do, and what we have already done. Uh, all of that in combination, uh, we think, is uh, mitigating the risk. It certainly doesn't reduce it to zero. It's a dangerous environment. We all recognize that. But we've got to continue to work by, with, and through the Iraqi government because they're the first line of defense. Uh, for the protection of our forces in their country. Well, thank you. I just want to be sure that we have assets on the ground to defend American installations in Iraq and Syria and other we do. places in the Middle East. Absolutely do. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Senator Rosen. Senator Hawley, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks to the witnesses for being here. Thank you for your service, as always. Mr. Secretary, if I could just start with you. I asked you earlier this year if you agreed with the National Defense Strategy Assessment that the U.S. military needs to be postured, and here's the quote, to deter and prevent a fait accompli by an agile, opportunistic adversary. You responded to me in writing, which I appreciated, and I appreciated the response you gave, which was, you said, and I'm quoting you now, yes, I agree with the Commission's finding. A combat-credible, forward deterrent posture is instrumental to our ability to deter and, if necessary, deny a fait accompli scenario. I assume you still agree with that. I do, Senator. Very good. And does it, would you also agree then, I, I assume that this would apply to our ability to maintain uh, and defeat, uh, maintain the ability to defeat a Chinese fait accompli against Taiwan? Is, is that accurate? Uh, that, that is accurate, Senator. I, I think uh, nobody wants to see a unilateral change of, uh, of the status quo with respect to uh, Taiwan. Uh, you've heard us to, uh, say that we are committed to helping uh, Taiwan uh, defend itself uh, in accordance with uh, the Taiwan Relations Act, uh, the three communiques, and the six assurances. And, and so our position hasn't changed in that regard, and, uh, and you know, we'll continue to, to help them develop the capability to General Milley, if I could just get you on this as well, would you agree that the U.S. should maintain its ability to defeat a Chinese fait accompli against Taiwan if necessary? I absolutely would, but uh, Senator, frankly, I'm not sure what a Chinese fait accompli in Taiwan is. Um, I, if you're talking about a military invasion of Taiwan, uh, crossing the Straits, the Taiwan Straits, with a sizable military force to seize an island the size of Taiwan against the military that they have and with the population that they have, uh, that's an extraordinarily complex and difficult operation, even if uh, against an unopposed force. That's a very hard thing to do. Uh, but I can assure you that we have the capabilities uh, if there were political decisions made in accordance with uh, the Taiwan Relations Act and so on. Uh, but we do have military capabilities. To, to defeat such a, an attempted invasion is what you're saying, General Milley. Got it. Um, good. Would, would you agree, Mr. Secretary, if I could come back to you, would you agree that we need to be, when we think about deterring China, that we need to be as focused on deterring China in the next three to five, seven years as we are 10 to 15 years from now. And I'm asking this, the context for this is we've heard now from the outgoing PACOM commander, from the incoming PACOM commander. We just heard earlier this week from the, the former Deputy National Security Advisor that uh, China is increasingly aggressive and that the window to deter that aggression may be shorter than we had thought. So thus my question, I mean, would you agree that we need to be focused on deterring them in the short to medium term, three, five, seven years, including the, the longer term? Uh, we, we do, and I would say that uh, those two issues are not mutually exclusive, Senator. As you know, they, they, they complement each other. While we're developing a future capability, we certainly have to bridge to that capability, and that is absolutely our focus. Great. Great. And um, Senator, I would, yeah, I would say that's what the key here is deterrence. We are in a condition of strategic great power competition. It needs to stay at competition. Uh, and deterrence is key to prevent it from going from competition to incident or competition to war. Yeah, very good. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. And, and if I could just follow up on that, General. The, the adversary, a competitor in this case, China, knowing that we have the ability to deter them, we have the ability to do what you said a minute ago, which is if they should choose military aggression, we have the ability, should we choose to deny that aggression, that's, that is important for deterrence, is it not? Them knowing we uh, have yeah, the ability. They, I mean, the, in, in simple terms, I mean, deterrence is actually a very complex thing, but in simple terms, you have to have the capability, your opponent has to know you have the capability, 
You've got to communicate that uh, uh, capability to your opponent, yes, know it. You have to communicate your will to use it if necessary, and both actors have to be rational. If all of those components are there, in simple terms, uh, you'll be able to achieve a state of deterrence. Thus far, it's achieved. Very good. Thank you for that. Mr. Secretary, let me just ask you in this context then about the Department's request for the Pacific Deterrence Initiative. In your request, you include, if I understand it correctly, $23 million for force design and posture improvements out of the $2.2 billion that's required. I'm, I'm trying to understand how providing our forces in the Pacific with just 1% of the funding they need for posture improvements to support those combat credible for, uh, forward deterrent posture that we're talking about, how that is, how can we do that and say that we're going to maintain the ability to deter or deny a, a fait accompli? Yeah, so Senator, I would flag for you just a couple of issues. First, the first issue is that, as I've said, uh, I said earlier, that uh, our intent is to make sure that uh, that we, with respect to the PDI uh, investment, that we uh, meet the congressional intent. And we believe that we have invested in a number of things uh, that meets that intent. And we've offered, and we will come to come meet with your staff and explain uh, where the investments are to make sure that the language isn't confusing. Uh, the second thing is we've invested $5.1 billion uh, in the PDI. Uh, the third thing I would flag for you is that, uh, you know, much of what we're investing in in terms of uh, uh, capability uh, and uh, is is really focused on our efforts to uh, uh, to counter uh, 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 the challenge presented by, by China. And I would also say that when you speak of, we speak of deterrence, we're not talking about just air, land, and sea. We're talking about using every capability across all domains uh, to include cyber and space. We're talking about uh, talking about integrating the the capabilities of our allies, which is which. I believe is very, very important. And we're talking about using every lever that the United States government has available to it to, in fact, uh, affect that, that deterrence. Thank you very much. Um, I've, got, I've got some more questions for you on this, Mr. Secretary. I'll follow up with you in writing, but I, I appreciate the opportunity to engage with you on it. Thank you, General. Thank, Thank you, you, Senator Hawley. Senator Tuberville, please. Thank you, sir. Thank you for being here today. Uh, put your microphone on, please. Hello. Hello. That worked? Good. Thank you. I thought mine was worn out after this long day, Mr. Secretary. I want to take a little different angle here. Uh, I've been a team builder all my life, and uh, uh, I'm on the Veterans Committee, Affairs Committee, and uh, I've been talking my first six months here with recruiters out in the field for the military. I'm a huge military person, military brat, uh, grew up in a military family. We talk about missiles and bombs and ships, and you got to have all those. But if we don't have the people, the best people we can possibly get, we're going to be in trouble. Uh, it's like winning a football game. Best players win games. There's no doubt, same thing with the military. And we've always had a strong military. Uh, uh, I hear in a lot of comments about, the, you know, why should I get in the military? They didn't look out for the people in Iraq and Afghanistan on the burn pits. Gentlemen, we, we got a huge problem. We're getting ready to spend hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars for veterans that have gone over and breathed that smoke and chemicals and all those things. We got to make better decisions than that. You know, all that money we're going to get ready to spend, you know, we could have gone to, to you guys, to, def to defense. But uh, it's going to me, it's going to be hard to recruit good people, the best people. Uh, and I hear all this uh, extremism stuff. And, again, I, I've dealt with people all my life. Uh, you know, you don't have to like each other to be on the team. I mean, a lot of my players could not stand other guys on the team. You know, they just had personality conflicts. But at the end of the day, you got to earn respect. you got to earn the trust and dedication and all that from, from your teammates. I mean, you, you got to learn that. And so I just hate for us to get off on this – this tangent of, of, of the people that we have in the military. Now, it, in football, for instance, it's your coaches that has, when you bring players in, you've got to build a team. You've got to bring them together. Same thing in the military. You've got lieutenants, captains, drill sergeants, corporals, all those. Everybody's responsibility is to bring that team together. And I just, 
the things that I'm hearing and seeing in the military bases I've been going to the last six months and talking to recruiters, we're gonna have a tough time. And then we're gotta, we gotta face the people in, in the big tech of taking the best and brightest because cyber is one of the things that we've really gotta get into in the military and continue to grow in the bill and all of our technology. You know, that being said, I, I just wanna make sure that we understand, you know, that we, we talk about all this equipment and the budget and all that. And I understand we've got to have that, but if we don't have the people, it doesn't make any difference. We had this selective service here a few months ago. They sat right here and they told us that if we had a draft today, we'd have 35 million people that we could draft from, 35 million. Only 450,000 of those 35 million are eligible to be in the military for one form. Of, that's not enough. That is not enough. We can't build a killing machine which is what our military is. You can say anything else. We gotta be able to kill the enemy when they come at us. And so that, that's just something I, I've, I've watched and listened to. I've been on the road talking and I want us to have the best military in the world and we probably do. Uh, I want us to fund the best military, but we've gotta fund our young men and women that are gonna get in the military and they gotta wanna come in. They've gotta wanna be there. They gotta wanna be there for the simple fact that they wanna fight for our, the best country on the face of the earth. Uh, uh, just one question I got for you, Secretary Austin, yes or no, I wrote you a letter. Uh, uh, me and Senator Wicker and Kramer, and our concern was, was disturbing about training materials coming from our military. Uh, and, and let me be clear, like you, we want to see good order and discipline in the ranks uh, for our military to remain the nonpartisan ins institution that Americans trust more than any other. But what emerged from some of the services revealed is disappointing partisan slant and a poorly defined First Amendment rights for military members. This year, we've seen multiple senior military leaders in uniform from official DOD channels criticize individual members of the press. That ain't got nothing to do with the military. To me, you just gotta go about your business. We've seen the National Guard march on elected officials here just down from this building. Uh, uh, we asked, Senator Dog, we asked you to provide a report on what steps your office will take to reprimand officers who inappropriately engage in partisan behavior to ensure that the stand down training materials comply with the guidance issued by your office. Uh, we asked for that report no later than May the 7th and we still hadn't gotten that. And I know you've been busy, but we just like to know, you know, the, the steps that we're gonna take to clamp down on people that don't deserve to be in our military. And uh, you know, I didn't want to get up here and rant, but you know, I've been a recruiter all my life and we've got to be able to recruit, you know, people to spend this money that, that we're, we're going to appropriate you in, in, the, in the right way because we're in dire straits. And uh, Senator, Secretary Officer, could I get that commitment? Uh, you certainly have that commitment. And I'll, you, I'd also like to offer a thought on, the, sure. on what you just said, Senator, and thanks for your, your continued support of our great military. And again, you've heard me say this a couple of times today, and I don't want our force or anybody else in this country to be confused. It is the most lethal organization on the face of the planet, and it will remain so, and it will remain the most cohesive organization uh, on the face of the planet. You know, when I, when I uh, came in as, a, as a Secretary of Defense, I issued guidance to the force, and that guidance included three things. My focus is on defending this nation and, taking, uh, and protecting our interests. The second thing is taking care of our people, and the third thing is teamwork. And like you, I've put a couple of teams together too. And I've, I've employed those teams in the combat, and I've watched these youngsters do amazing things in support of their country and in support of each other. It's unbelievable. And, and so, you know, I have a pretty good feel in terms of what it takes to create that kind of cohesion, and cohesion is what is most important to me, just like it is to you, Senator. I, I know you absolutely under, understand that, and you've, you've demonstrated that you understand that with, uh, with some tremendous success over the years. Uh, regarding the burn pits, uh, you know, the, the welfare of our veterans is, uh, is foremost in my mind. I mean, it's, it's, that's something that me and the chairman both really care about. And I would tell you that the secretary of the VA, uh, Secretary McDonough, shares that concern. And, and, and he and I, 
uh, work together closely on a number of issues, and we have vowed to make sure that we don't lose our veterans as a as a transition from active duty to uh, to uh, uh, to retirement or, or get out of the military and go do something else. I've inhaled those fumes from burn pits. The chairman has inhaled those fumes from burn pits. We know it's important to take care of our our troops, and you have our commitment to remain focused on that. But I would also say that this is not just the Army's problem. It's not just the, the military's problem. This is the issue for the United States of America. These are our troops, and we're going to do everything we can to take care of them. And I know that all the great resourcers and authorizers that are in this room share that same commitment, and we felt that commitment going forward. And I know that it's the, it's the, uh, the reason that you asked that question. But the question you have is, are we committed to it? And Senator, I am absolutely committed to making sure that we do what we can uh, to ensure that this issue is addressed. And I know that Secretary McDonough is working this issue very hard as well. Thank you. Thank you for your service. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Tuberville. Uh, this is Secretary Brown. I will recognize Senator King, who will ask one question, and he will also uh, preside and conclude the hearing. And then he will recognize Senator Sullivan for one question. I'd ask uh, both the questions and the uh, responses be as concise and eloquent as they've been all morning. Thank you very much, Chairman. Senator. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first, uh, 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 just a very brief observation. There's been a lot of talk about budgets and comparisons of budgets and budgets with China. Uh, I uh, yield to no one in terms of my determination to successfully compete uh, with China on all fronts. I would point out, though, even though they have had significant increases lately, their budget this year is still less than one-third of ours. I, I think that's important just to have that, that context because that, we've been talking about growth, but they were showing significant growth from a much lower base. Uh, General Milley, I am gravely concerned about the men and women in Afghanistan who supported and aided our troops and that we're not moving fast enough to be sure that they are brought to safety. I think this is a essential moral commitment of this country and also a practical one. If we leave these people to the tender mercies of the Taliban, I don't know who is ever going to cooperate and help us again in, a, in another setting. So uh, I, I hope that the, both the Pentagon, the White House, and all the agencies of the U.S. government are committed to this as an urgent priority, an urgent priority, and that if we can't repatriate all of these people to this country, that we at least make arrangements to get them safely out of Afghanistan. Can you give me your thoughts on that, please? Well, Senator, uh, first, uh, I think the, the President, SecDef, uh, the Secretary of State, uh, myself, others have all commented on the importance of making sure that we keep faith with uh, those that have supported us over the last two decades in Afghanistan, and, and that clearly is our intent, and, and, and we will do that. Uh, in terms of specific actions, Department of State has the lead um, on the Special Immigrant Visa Program and some other programs with respect to those Afghans that have supported us. Uh, that planning is uh, uh, working through the system right now. Uh, and, but I can commit to you that it's my belief that uh, the United States government uh, uh, will do what is necessary in order to ensure the safety and protection of those that have been working with us for two decades. Thank you. The, the, the term working through the system is what gives me some, sure. some no, concern. Uh, this, this is, uh, this is a, an absolutely urgent priority over the next six to eight weeks, I would say, as our troops draw down. So I appreciate your commitment on that. And Mr. Secretary, I assume you, you make the, absolutely the same commitment. You're, you're correct, Senator. We, um, this is very important to us, and uh, we're pushing as hard as we can uh, on our end to, uh, to move as fast as we can. I know Secretary Blinken has asked for an increase in, uh, in authorizations in terms of numbers to move into the SIV process, and I would ask uh, your support in, in, uh, in providing that authorization. And again, uh, anything that you can do to expand our, our current capabilities uh, in terms of authorizations would be very, very much appreciated. I'm sure the members of this committee will work to that end and look forward to working with you. Uh, Senator Sullivan. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I share your views, and I know most of the members of the committee do, on keeping faith with those who support us in Afghanistan. And gentlemen, I appreciate you running the gauntlet today. It's an important element of our, our constitutional oversight responsibilities. I have one final question. Um, a growing and critical area of great power competition with Russia, certainly, but also with China, is uh, our strategic interest in the Arctic. And Mr. Secretary, uh, as you know, in general, uh, our, each of the military services, in some ways prompted by this committee, have now published an Arctic strategy. I think all of us view this as a, as a positive development. And uh, both of you, during your confirmation hearings, had committed uh, to focus on this area of our national security to fully resource uh, each of the service Arctic strategies. Deputy Secretary Hicks, through her confirmation process, did the same. In a Strategic Forces Subcommittee hearing yesterday, I had the chance to ask General Van Herc, who's the NORTHCOM commander, in his role as the designated advocate for Arctic capabilities, how he saw each of the services implementing their respective strategies in the President's uh, new budget submission. And he told me that DOD resourcing for the various service Arctic strategies was, quote, inching along, but that DOD, quote, didn't move the, the ball very far down the field with the FY22 budget. So I, I want to ask both of you, do you share this view? And how can we work to fully resource the service strategies that have been put out, the DOD strategies that have put up, been put out in this important area of uh, great power competition. Uh, thank you, Senator. You know, when, when uh, we talked before, uh, you know, I indicated to you that the Arctic and Arctic strategy was important to, to me, and that hasn't changed. It remains so. As you know, we're working uh, on developing our national defense strategy overall and also working through uh, to refine our force posture globally. Uh, as we as we develop that national defense strategy, certainly uh, the Arctic will be a, an, an area that we will we will take into consideration and make sure that that we have the right emphasis, the right focus, uh, and that will that uh, that strategy will drive our resources. Great, thank you, uh, General Milley. You have a view? Yeah, on? absolutely. We're committed to the Arctic strategy, and you know this whole issue with the Arctic is a classic example of the strategic military impact of climate change uh, as. Uh, as the snow caps melt, uh, the ice packs melt, uh, it's exposing further resources. The Russians and Chinese are realizing that. So they are clearly uh, trying to exploit some of that. And we are going to see increased, not decreased, great power competition in the Arctic over time. Uh, and we do need to resource, fully resource the Arctic strategy. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I'd like to associate myself with Senator Sullivan's questions on the Arctic. It's an incredibly important strategic area. I appreciate your your commitments. Uh, with no further questions, and I understand the decision has been made not to go to a, an additional closed session, so I want to thank our witnesses for their testimony today, for your forthrightness, for the information that you've shared, and most of all, for your service to our country. With that, this hearing is adjourned.